they put the cross on him and made him walk. Every time he fell, he pushed up with the cross. It was with determination that nothing would stop him from delivering us. So every time he stood up, he said, I'll do this for you. This is Touched by Heaven. Everyday encounters with God, those moments when heaven and earth collide and we see God. We see his hand reaching out to us, attempting to get our attention, inviting us into a closer relationship. Here we share stories of encounter with angels, divine intervention, prophetic dreams, visions, near-death experiences, big and little God incidents. I'm your host, Trapper Jack. Welcome. So glad you're here for episode 153, a personal story of the passion. We're going to go back about 100 episodes, an episode that was called, Do You Believe It's True? You know, this whole crazy, you know, God becomes man. Come on, virgin birth. I mean, who makes up this stuff, right? Do you believe it's true? Uh, We're going to grab a couple of stories from that episode. By the way, that was a song by Huey Lewis in the news that was playing in my head that day. Songs bubble up seemingly out of nowhere, and we know where that nowhere is. You got to hear Tracy's story. If you haven't heard it before, or maybe you've heard it, then you got to hear it again. I could, this, her, her experience of the passion just blows everything else away. I mean, reading The Passion, it's so black and white, and this is the emotion of The Passion as Tracy went through it with Jesus. She had this experience. She was at a women's conference. She was at this prayer and communion service. She goes down on her knees, and bam, suddenly she's outside in the cold. Where am I? Somebody is agonizing, and it was Jesus, the agony in the garden, all the way through to the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. It changed me. The other part of this is uh, David Inesco. He's an expert in the Shroud of Turin, the burial cloth of some guy of a couple thousand years ago from the Middle East, some guy who has the wounds of Christ and the thorn marks in his head and the spear in the side and this event that happened on that burial cloth that they cannot duplicate, this event horizon, I think it's what it's also called, like this explosion that happened, maybe a resurrection. I mean, it's just, it, they can't duplicate it. And just the science in this burial cloth this 3D image, a 3D image of this, of it sure looks like uh, something happened, maybe a resurrection. We'll talk about that with David Inesco. But I want to mention to you, you know, someone has said this is the fifth gospel. You know, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and someone said, no, if it's authentic, it's the first gospel. It was there before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote their gospels. Uh, because it has suffer, a passionate suffering, it has death, it has Jewish burial customs, and I believe it has resurrection on it. Uh, I, I have reason to believe that my 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 my, my father became a, a believer in Jesus based on the evidence of the man in the shroud. Uh, you know, when they put scotch tape over the shroud in 73 and in 78, lifted the scotch tape off the shroud, mounted it on microscopic slides and looked at it under a microscope, they discovered dirt in the nose, the knee and the soles of the feet. And there's a mineral in that dirt called travertine aragonite comes from one place on the earth, indigenous to Jerusalem, the limestone quarries uh, of Jerusalem. And that's it. And, and that's no it. other place. No other place. No other place. This is indigenous to, uh, to Israel, and particularly Jerusalem. Okay. And so the man walked and fell on, on limestone dust that has this mineral on it. The head was punctured. Uh, the, um, uh, you know, and, and it was a skull cap. It just wasn't a wreath or a circle that, uh, you know, the man in the shroud... Um, uh, had on his head, but he those was holes like, are throughout the head, uh, throughout the head, okay. uh, more like a helmet of thorns. Wow. So there's blood flows and trickles uh, and rivulets on the head throughout the hair. Uh, there's uh, blood flow uh, in 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 uh, the uh, on the arms, uh, on the forearms, coming uh, corresponding to a, uh, a nail wound or, or a puncture wound, I should say. Uh, in the wrist. Okay, now let's talk about when people, because some people become fixed on the nail went through the hand. It says so. Doubting yeah. Thomas, put your, you know, yeah. Yeah. it was. There's always the hand is yeah. mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about the hand. Yeah, yeah. When we look at the Old Testament language, which was Hebrew, and the New Testament, which is Greek, th- that's that's where we have to draw our information from. Uh, the, you know, the language of the Gospels, the language of the Old Testament. And in the book of Kings, I'm not sure if it's first or second Kings, it refers to the word kair, C-H-E-I-R. It's a Hebrew word, kair, which means hand. And it refers to in Kings, uh, women wearing bracelets on their kair. Okay. And, and that word 
in, in the original language of Hebrew, means fingertips to elbow. Psalm 22, uh, when it talks about they have pierced my hands and my feet, David says, um, you know, most people think that meant palm. But mm-hmm. in the original language, it meant anything from fingertips to elbow. And of course, we have a reference in Kings, which refers to the wrist. Um, this man on the shroud was crowned with thorns. Uh, medical doctors have looked at, you can do an autopsy of this man based on images. Better On the images. markings. Yeah, you can mm-hmm. do an autopsy. They can't find any broken bones on this man. Yet, he was marred. He was uh, uh, damaged more than any man or woman they've ever seen in their lives. To a man and to a woman, they said they've never seen a body more damaged. And once course, again, in prophecy, it said uh, Isaiah bones. said he was marred more than any man. In the side, the right side of the man in the shroud, he was speared between the fifth and the sixth rib. And uh, it's interesting that the width of that spear wound, four centimeters, uh, is identical to uh, a Roman lance that was uncovered. It was either in Herculaneum or Pompeii, which was, you know, the city was destroyed by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius and you know, 70, 70, right. 70, everything frozen in time, percent, frozen in time. Right. They've uncovered a, a Roman lance from that period. And the width of that lance, four centimeters is identical to the width of the, of the, of the wound of the man in the shroud. There, there's uh, apparent uh, markings on both feet that uh, took a nail through both uh, through the left and in, right instep. The left foot would have been on top of the right foot. And there's evidence there uh, on the shroud that that's the case. So would, taking the typical Roman crucifixion, if you will, which ended, as you said, there's a certain date where they didn't do this yeah, anymore. Yeah, about, uh, yeah, about three, uh, early early 4th century, Constantine the emperor outlawed crucifixion. So the nails would be typical, The but the lance is unique. The, 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 the head wounds... Unique. Unique. Yeah. yeah. No broken bones. Unique. Unique. Yeah. Because generally that was the way to find it, to finish them off. They correct. Would, they, yeah, that's right. They would, they would take an iron bar or, uh, you know, a, a heavy wooden board and, uh, and they would fracture the tibia and the fibula, the lower leg and the femur because you cannot push up to exhale. See, in the slumping position on the cross, you can inhale. Uh, but you can't exhale. You have to pull up and push up to exhale. And what you know, and this this sounds brutal. And anyone listening right now is going, "Man, what? Are you, come on, guys!" Yeah. But th- to point out what I think the Passion of the Christ did so beautifully to yes. the movie, and some people can't watch that movie. Correct. I am. I, I can't not watch it almost on a yearly basis because yeah. it reminds you what this man took yes. physically, let alone all the sins of the world. Uh, sure. there, there, has anyone ever? put up with with this this man was already dead and his legs weren't broken it amazed the the doctors uh, who've looked at this uh, you know you can, like i said you can do an autopsy that there doesn't appear to be any broken bone the nose is broken uh the car- but that's cartilage that's, that's cartilage. Not, a, not a bone, not bone. that's right. right the bridge of the nose it appears to be displaced he's got depending on who you talk to between 100 and 200 flog marks on his body from his shoulders down to his ankles the only area not flogged was the area over the heart. They'd have killed him. Uh, it's amazing he didn't die. He died upon crucifixion. He didn't die from the flogging. They appear to be barbell-shaped with spikes in them. And that's what the man in the shroud was was flogged with. When, so I, when, when they look at this, when scientists look at this, when criminologists look at this, yeah. are they surprised that that didn't kill him, all the flogging? Oh, all? yes. Oh, oh, absolutely. They say that uh, medical doctors, forensic pathologists, coroners, trauma surgeons, emergency room doctors have said never have say, they've seen a body more damaged than the man in the shroud. But yet... The face. Let's get to the face. When we look at that damage to the body, uh, we 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 hearken to uh, uh, Nazi Germany, and we and we look at victims uh, of the Holocaust, the brutality done to those bodies. You know, they crucified victims during the during the Holocaust just to see how it was done. Almost invariably, when you look at film footage of victims, dead victims, or 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 photographs, you'll see what's called a death mask, permanently etched, registered on that face at the moment. You see pain. You see the face of pain. You see pain. You see suffering. You see torture. It's there. When you look at the man in the shroud, there is no death mask. And many researchers, scientific researchers, have come to faith in Jesus because of that uh, phenomenon 
Uh, he shows no pain. He shows no pain. He shows a serene countenance, a peaceful countenance, even a regal, majestic one, uh, you know, as, as you gaze upon that face. And to many researchers, uh, not, notwithstanding the stigmata on, on you know, the, the nails and the wrists and the feet, the helmet of thorns, the spear wound in the side, the flogging, notwithstanding that, but 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 the coup de grace, if you will, was was the image of the face. How could that serene image be registered in spite of that brutality? And that kind of uh, brought them to faith in Christ. The Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. Yeah. The scripture says he's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the Prince of Peace. And it appears to be registered on the face of the man in the shroud. You see, peace is not an idea. It's a man. It's a person. His name is Jesus Christ. Do you want to go to the, this color that's on the shroud or what's, uh, you know, we, we can talk about the color. It's a, it's a, it's a straw like color. It's, it's a yellowish color, uh, on the cloth itself. The image, uh, on the shroud is a surface phenomenon. If you look at the cloth under a microscope and, and you, you can obviously see threads and you can see fibers coming off those threads. Uh, actually, a fiber which is uh, from the shroud is is less in diameter circumference than a hair on the back of your arm, probably one tenth the size. So when you look at the threads under a microscope, uh, you can take 100 of these fibers, uh, you know, weave them together and you have a thread. Well, what's interesting on the shroud image is that the image rests on the top two or three fibers deep into that thread. Uh, it doesn't go all the way through 100 of these fibers that make up the thread. It's only on the top two or three. The fibers beneath those top two or three are pure white, pristine. They have not been chemically. Point being is that if you tried to paint this on. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it, it would go all the way through. It, 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 would, it would cake from one thread to the next uh, thread. Uh, it, yeah, there'd be cementation. Yeah. There, 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 there would be a gluing uh, factor. This is something that happened on each thread individually and only so deep. Only so deep. Yeah. A very, very uh, tips of, uh, of the thread, the top of the thread, two or three fibers deep of a hundred. This, this color. It, this, this color, this yellowish yeah. color. It's just called like a, a pre Premature aging, which if you put a put a newspaper in sunlight, come back two hours, it turns yellow. And um, so whatever created the image and it's an oxidation and dehydration of, of, of the fiber, some kind of a, a chemical process, a chemical reaction. Uh, and we don't know what the catalyst was that created this chemical reaction, but it's an, a dehydration oxidation of the linen fiber. So um, that's what we're talking about, you know. And somehow the theory being then, to, in order for that color to appear, there had to be some sort of explosion, radiation, some <laughs> an event happened to to create something there. Yeah, an event happened, and they cannot duplicate this. Nor can they, they, okay, let's go back right there. Yeah. They've tried to duplicate what is on this shroud. Yeah, yeah. Um, this obviously is the only burial cloth of its kind ever that's ever been uncovered anywhere that has this effect on it. The only, the only burial cloth in existence that has an image, and a well-defined image, I might add. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are thousands of burial garments uh, in the world, you know, mummies, tuts, pharaohs. And they have, you know, putrefaction and decomposition, body rot, blood, dirt, you know, grime on them, but nothing within well-defined image of a man who was crucified Roman style, which was outlawed by the Emperor Constantine in the 4th century. You know, mm -hmm. if... This image, which is a dehydration and oxidation of the linen fiber, some kind of heat process, you know, and, uh, you know, a dehydrative process involves heat and it sucks the water out of the fibers. So the water was sucked out of the fibers by some kind of dehydration process. So some kind of light and or heat process, uh, uh, you know created this image they do know that scientifically they know that had to be the process that, that, that absolutely clear-cut no doubt no no argument no controversy there dehydrative oxidative process colored the fiber of the linen on the top two or three threads of uh, fibers of the thread they so just can't recreate they, they just can't recreate it and if we're if, if we're just going to say just for you know throwing it out there that this was the result of the resurrection of Jesus, that that Shekinah glory, the Shekinah glory of Jesus. When Jesus appeared to Peter, James and John, he was transfigured. He was light. God is light. Jesus is God. Jesus is light. But you have uh, 
for many, many would say it's a photographic negative on the cloth. When you take a picture of that in the dark room, a positive image emerges. Nothing like it in the on the planet. So they didn't really see everything on the shroud until someone took a picture in 1898, Secundo Pia. To see the negative, not the picture, but the negative before that picture was made is where it really comes to life. Yes. 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 The image on the shroud itself is a negative like quality. Uh, image and when you photograph that in the dark room, a positive emerges. The the darks and the lights uh, reverse. What's 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 dark on the cloth becomes light on the positive image, and vice versa. So, um, isn't it uh, interesting how through time, as technology improves, more of this becomes evident that this is Christ. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I would agree that that, uh, you know, and, and Dr. John Jackson, who led the team in 1978, the Sturb team, personal friend of mine, been in my home, uh, has what's called a collapse theory that 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 the body, uh, for lack of a better word, dematerialized in the tomb. Uh, irradiated and there's a there's an x-ray quality to the body that you can look at with with the proper equipment you can look at the hands the finger bones you can look at eye socket the skull the eye sockets teeth they know how many they can count the teeth they can see nerves in the teeth it appears to be an x-ray quality using the right equipment to the man in the shroud suggesting that the body irradiated and and the cloth fell through the body created the image now this would have had to have been in a millisecond of time a thousandth of a second, because it would have, if, if it was any longer in duration, it would have blew up uh, the surrounding area. I mean, it's like a, you're talking about, you know, a nuclear explosion, if you will. For this process. For this take, process. So it's and a millisecond. Millisecond. Millisecond of time. And then the whole, then the top part just collapses on collapsed the bottom. Collapsed through. Just, John Jackson has a collapse theory that okay. it collapsed through the body when it dematerialized. So that's what we have. We so have those threads. Image. And once again, this is a, a it takes what would you say a hundred of these threads to make something about a hundred of the fibers to make a thread. Okay. So think about that. The thinness of that. Yes. And two or and, three discolored. And so you're only going in two or three deep, but it's there to that degree and then yeah. gone. Yes. Wow. Yes. And, and can't be duplicated as you might expect. I uh, don't know the energy, uh, you know, uh, and if we don't have the technology to recreate that now, they certainly didn't have it even in medieval times. Oh my goodness. <laughs> let no. alone oh, first oh, century. Oh, you know? Absolutely not. You, you're talking about, um, uh, a medieval forger having to, paint, if you will, in negative prior to the invention of photography without being able to check his work using fresh blood. And I believe the shroud is uh, for today those who need help, maybe in their belief or in their unbelief, to come to the cross, that there exists and there is extant in the world today an object, an archaeological site, if you will, of of of, uh, of of the cloth that wrapped the body of Jesus, and it presents the gospel to those who need a little more than than what they read in God's word. And if it contradicted the word in any way, I couldn't and I wouldn't talk about it. But rather than contradict the word, it it's, it affirms the word. Well, God bless you, David Inesco, for what you do uh, and how you've been driven for thirty years. There's no question this is God driven. So uh, yes. God be with you and continue to be with you as you share the the truth and the and the search for truth. And as time goes on, as I say, the science yeah. the science is showing us the way. And that's the yeah. beauty of this because there's no separation of God and science, no matter how some try to try to disconnect this is it's just further proof through science well know. thank you philip and thank you for the opportunity to be with you this and week. and i want to make sure everyone if you want to find out more about the shroud about david and contact david uh website again is man in the shroud.org gonna take a little pause right here in this episode a personal story of the passion and that personal story is coming up with tracy in just a moment a uh, quick uh, shout out to uh, my patreon friends patreon.com search for trapper jack if you'd like to help us out on a monthly basis like michael michael lampanen thank you so much michael for supporting what we do here at touch by heaven uh early in fact earlier today i'm recording this on march 25th that date mean anything to you march 25th well it's the feast of the annunciation nine months from today as i record this uh, mary's gonna have a baby so it's, uh, it was uh, ironic, but we don't believe in coincidence, so no irony here, that I'd be talking to Joni. Joni Darren was back with us in episode 116, which is very cool if you want to hear that episode, but she had something recently happen when 
a miraculous metal miraculously appeared, and it's just a very cool story, and you'll be hearing that in the weeks to come. So we were talking earlier today. You got a second? I had to, I, yeah, I was, I was so anxious. I had to run off my anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> You make me you make me nervous. What oh, I, I did not. I mean, you were great. You were talking about. What are you talking about? You were great. Yeah, I know. And Joni's a supporter also uh, on Patreon. And I just said, why? Why? Because your podcast does a lot for my faith. And I think the one thing I have learned is in order to fortify your own faith, you have to be around people that add to it. Because People can take away from it or people can add to it. And so I have found I need to have your stories in my life. I need to have other people in my life that feeds my faith. And that is invaluable. But you don't just listen. I mean, you you not only are a listener, you've given us stories and your upcoming one that we'll do with the Miraculous Medal is really cool. And then the fact that you also support is just, you know, you got the trifecta, you know, going on here, Joan. Well, Trapper, I need you, but I'm just, I'm just glad you do what you do because we need that. In this world, there is just too much darkness, and we need your light to help our light shine. Well, thank you. I, I think that's, that, I guess that's all I, I guess that's all, <laughs> that's all I could ever ask for. That's really all I could ever ask, uh, ask for. So no. thank you for that. You are so welcome. All right. Thanks, Joni. We so appreciate your support through Patreon, and we look forward to uh, hearing your story in an upcoming episode. But uh, here at episode 153, you can uh, click through to Patreon or go to patreon.com, search for Trapper Jack. And thank you so much again for your support with what we do. All right, let's get back to the second part of this. And Tracy's personal story. She was at a church prayer and communion service. And when she knelt down... This was a vision. And as soon as I kneeled on the ground, it went black. I felt like I was outside. I felt like I was in a movie, but I felt like I was outside. It was cold. It was damp. It was dark. And I could feel somebody hurting only it was more, it was more like a feeling like you wish you could back up. You could, you wish you could back up right now because you know, this is the feeling I had in my, my gut was like, you know, how terrible it would feel like if you accidentally hit somebody with your car and you wish you could turn back time, you wouldn't hit them. You know, it was a feeling like you wish you could turn back time and, but terrible, like deep, hard. I wish I could turn back time. And I was looking in the dark for this person who was agonizing and I swear to you, I was, I was in the garden and I, it was Jesus. And I can't tell you what his face looked like, but I, and it was him. And, uh, I looked at him and as soon as I knew the agony was that it was time for the cross to come really soon, I was aware of my sin. Every sin in my life just popped up before my face. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no, I, I brought him here to this point. And he felt me feel that. And it interrupted his father, you know, if this cup could pass moment. He felt me feel guilt for my life. And he stopped me and he looked at me and he said, no. Like, don't feel that. He said, I'll do this for you. And the next thing I know, I could feel anger and frenzy. And I look to my left and I see this mob of people coming up the hill with torches and angry. There's so many men coming up for him. They were slipping down off the side of this narrow road. And, uh, and I saw the I saw the struggle. I swear to you, I would never make this up. I saw I saw the ear get cut off. I saw Jesus put it back on and he looked at me, he said, I'll no, you know, like stop, stop this fighting, I'll do this for you. And the next thing I remember, it was in a cold stone courtyard. And they had a bag over his head and they were beating him. And I thought, 
why isn't he angry? Why is, because I could feel what he was feeling and he was not angry. He was just tolerating what they were doing. Almost like, let's just get through this. Let's just get through this. And I was sad watching it. And at every point he said, I'll do this for you. After they took him and they started whipping him. It was like every lash that he took, his heart was that he was pulling it off of us. He was so happy to take it off of us. It was like one less for them, one less for them. And he looked at me and he said, I'd, I'll do this for you. And then when they put the cross on him and made him walk, every time he fell, it was, there's no way that this weak body is going to keep me from going all the way. And every time he pushed up with a cross, it was with determination that nothing would stop him from delivering us. So every time he stood up, he said, I'll do this for you. And then when he got to the cross, it was like a relief. And he was just done and he was there. And uh, when they raised him up, he said, I'll do this for you. And once they raised him up, all the way and the cross went down, it went completely black for me. And I just sat there stunned thinking, this is what communion is about. This is what communion is about. I never saw it that way before. <laughs> and uh, I just sat there stunned at how much he's done for us and his heart at every step of that. Um, and as I was sitting there with my communion in my hands, just thanking him for everything for that weekend, everything he's done, uh, it started getting light and I realized, Ooh, they're turning the lights on. I better, I better take this communion, you know, cause with your eyes closed, you can tell when the lights are coming on. So I thought, well, I should hurry and take this communion. And Yet it kept getting brighter and brighter, and it was actually still the vision. And it was daytime, and he was standing in front of me, smiling. And he, and he just had like this amazing smile. And he said, and I'll do this for you. And uh, he ascended. And that was the end of it. And it was amazing. <laughs> and uh, that was that was it. And I just left that retreat a different person <laughs> grateful that I would be able to feel what he felt like for us through every station you know it was love it was compassion for us it was never angry at the way they were treating him it was like, let's just get through this. Let's just get through this. But, but, but so unbelievable the feeling when he was being whipped. I could feel the pain, but I could also feel him saying, that's one less for them. <laughs> he loves us so much. Oh. You saw the resurrected Christ too, then. Unbelievable. Why, Lord? I mean, like, I'm a mess. I don't know why. Watching him crucified. You actually get to see mm -hmm. the nails go into him? Did, yeah. You saw that part too? Yeah. Everything. Tell In me, tell me could... about that. Tell me about the part where they're nailing nails into pain, his body. Pain. Pain. You know, it's not like, you know, he was God, but he was man. So he felt everything. But his heart was never, I mean, his heart was, Father, forgive them. 
They don't know what they're doing. If we knew who he was, we would have never done that. And, uh, I mean, he felt the pain, but at that point, what I was feeling from him is I'm almost done with this, almost done with this torture. It was never anger towards anybody ever. There was times of pain, but you know, the biggest shock for me was when he was being beaten because I was indignant. How can they do that to God? And why, why aren't there angels just getting these people? You know, why, why is there such peace and why is he just still and just letting it happen? Why isn't he mad? Because this is what he had to go through for us. You know, and, and, and the biggest one was the eye opener. Well, I mean, each one was big in its own way, but when he was being whipped and he was saying, that's one less for them, one less for them, you know, it, every whip on him was pulling punishment off of us by his stripes. We are healed. And then when he was pushing up with the cross, like there's nothing that's going to stop me from going all the way for them determination. So his heart, you know, is just so for us. I mean, <laughs> how much does he love us? Look at the cross, his arms are outraged. You know, it's like, how much more could anybody do? No more. <laughs> wow. Uh, you just changed people with that one. You just, people just changed <laughs> with that one. What a gift. What a gift for you for it all of us. It is a gift. Thank you, Lord. I just don't even get it. <laughs> One of the things you said, and I had a thought on this a year ago, and I thought, was I crazy to about was I crazy to have this thought? And that was his joy. His joy in the pain, his joy of what he was doing. He was happy to do it for us. Happy, I knew that. Maybe like, you yeah. said happy, but it was like he was happy to do this for us. Determined. You said the word determined. I'm taking so this. So determined. So determined to take time. that cross and those whippings mm -hmm. and the beatings. I am, I, I'm getting through this. I'm getting through this one. And don't you, don't worry about it. I got this. I got this for you. I got this for mm -hmm. you. I'll do this for you. Every one of us the same. No partiality. Nobody's favored over anybody. You know, he just wants us all back. And that's the thing is like with each station, there was just a different feeling that I never could have known, but just determination to stand up again, to stand up again. Nothing's keeping me from doing this. Thanks, Tracy. Tracy Icovetti, once again, here on Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God. I'll do this for you. I'll, isn't that gorgeous? I'll do this for you, says, says it to Tracy, says to me, says to you, I'll do this for you. The love, the forgiveness. There's no anger. The peacefulness. Let's just get through this. Let's just get through this. Almost through this torture. Almost. Just a beautiful perspective. I just, like I say, that, that, that look at the passion does more for me than I think anything I've ever heard or seen. Just that perspective of his sacrifice for us. He loves us that much. Who does that? That is our Jesus Christ. God bless you for listening. Thank you so much for listening to Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God. I need your story, absolutely, that you are the fuel, so let me know. Uh, your story, your encounter with angels. Is that what it is? Visions, prophetic dreams, near-death experiences, divine interventions? Let me hear it at touchedbyheaven.net. I'll get back to you. Thank you for your help through Patreon, and just thank you for listening and sharing these episodes with others. Here at Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God, I'm Trapper Jack.